Mars in a way that's simply not possible on the moon. So one could go on, but in short, for the coming age of exploration, Mars compares to the moon as North America compared to Greenland in the previous age of exploration. Greenland was closer to Europe. Europeans reached it first, but it was ultimately too barren an environment in which a new branch of human civilization could be established. In contrast, North America is one in which one could be established and flourish. So if we're talking about going into space to stay, if we're talking about sustainability, you want to go to where the resources are. Okay? It, the, the contrast that is sometimes drawn between Mars as the flag and footprint place and Moon as the place where you go to stay is exactly the reverse. Okay? Moon, a Moon base would have much greater logistic requirements than a Mars base because on Mars you don't have to ship your water to Mars. The water is there. Carbon is there. It's all there. And if we can make use of the resources, we can establish ourselves there. And if we can establish ourselves there, if we, in our time, can do what we can do, which is establish that first little tiny human foothold on Mars, then we'll put our stamp on the future because hundreds of years from now, there will be human civilization on Mars. And when they look back at this time, there'll be nothing that anyone is doing in this period in history that they will consider more significant than what we did to make them possible. You know, 1492, you ask any American what happened in 1492, they'll say Christopher Columbus set sail. But in 1492, England and France signed a peace treaty. The Borgias took over the papacy. Lorenzo de' Medici died. To people into current events, those might have seemed more important. But to us today, it's Columbus's voyage that, that stands as the important event. Similarly this. Now, I see humans to Mars in a decade. How is that possible? Okay? I mean, various mission architectures that you've seen undoubtedly make it seem like a very futuristic proposition. But it is not. Okay, and now I'm going to walk you through how this can actually be done in, in brief. Uh, unfortunately, not in as much detail as I'd like, but I've written a book on the subject, and the details are all there. Uh, may I have the next chart? First of all, how long does it take to get to Mars? It's the same question as how much rope does it take to connect two points that are 10 meters apart. In principle, it can take any amount. Okay. It can be done with 10 meters if you pull it tight. And the thing that pulls it tight is the schedule. Okay? The thing that made Apollo work was the schedule. Okay? Kennedy said we had to be on the moon by the end of the decade. Had he not done that, the program would have failed because there were any number of factions with all sorts of other projects that they would like to do, space stations, Saturn 9s, nuclear rockets, who were willing to say, well, you can't do your program until you do my program. But at a certain point, they were squeezed out of the picture when the rope was pulled tight because people finally said, look, do we really want to go to the moon or don't we? And that's how this happened. Okay, but the issue is whether you want to collect the posts or whether you want to sell rope. So let's look at a couple of rope sales. Next chart. Okay, of course, there's the lunar base, the lunar toll booth. Okay, um, the previous administration in announcing the vision, uh, Bush said, we got to go to the moon because you can launch from the moon easier from the Earth, and indeed you can. But before you launch a spacecraft from the moon, you have to get to the moon, and the delta V required to go from low Earth orbit to the lunar surface is actually greater than that to go from low Earth orbit to the surface of Mars. So even if there was a lunar Cape Canaveral in place right now, and they were making propellant and giving it away for free to anyone who would stop by, it still would not make any sense to go to the moon. Okay. The, the, chart. Okay, then um, there's this one, okay, there's the advanced propulsion crowd. You have to build our giant spaceship. Um, here's one that was designed under the Prometheus program. You can see it's quite large. Mars is there for scale. Um, and, um, um, and they had all kinds of fantastical assumptions, but in fact, A, it isn't necessary to go to Mars, and B, if you actually do the mission analysis using real numbers, you find out it offered no mission advantages at all. Next chart. Now, this is one we commonly hear today. You can train for Mars on the moon, and it's certainly you can train for Mars on the moon, but you can do it in the Arctic at three orders of magnitude lower cost. And this, by the way, is a photograph of the Mars Society's base on Devon Island on the rim of a 20-kilometer a, 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 a diameter impact crater in the middle of a polar desert. And we just had a one-month mission there. It cost us $75,000. If you want to do it at higher fidelity, you could up the budget in order of magnitude, and it would be $750,000. It would still be a, a trivial percentage of the cost of doing practice exercises on the moon. And we can uh, initiate such activities today, not waiting until 2019 or something like that. Okay, So that justification isn't there. 
that re leaves the question, how do we actually do a human Mars mission? Next chart. Okay. Well, any mission requires an appropriate launch vehicle. But by the way, I'm showing you charts now that were uh, actually developed when we designed this mission, which is known as the Mars Direct Plan, which was designed at Martin Marietta back in uh, 1990. And as you know, Mr. Augustine, uh, one of the great benefits of working at the Martin Company is when you leave, they let you keep your charts. So, here. Um, <laughs> um, the, this is uh, a heavy lift vehicle, in this case, shuttle derived, uh, four SSMEs, two solids, uh, ET core, and a hydrogen oxygen upper stage. And um, I hope I won't disappoint you too much if I don't give you an extended pitch on why this launch vehicle, other than various other launch vehicles that have been shown to you. Uh, like the Ares 5 or the direct vehicle. Frankly, any of them will work. Any heavy lift launch vehicle with an upper stage to do a large scale injection on Trans Mars will suffice. Uh, what won't work, however, is not a heavy lift launch vehicle. And uh, this is a subject that, you know, uh, I, I think is very much before you right now. Some people want to abandon the goal of heavy lift. If you we cut the contract on the Saturn V in 1962. We flew it in 1966. We were on the moon three years later. If we had a heavy lift launch vehicle today, we could be on the moon within four years easily. And the reason why we haven't gone anywhere since the mid-70s space is primarily due to the fact that we haven't had a heavy lift. Okay? The, 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 you know, any number of people, including me, have designed various plans or attempted to, to go to the moon or asteroids or Mars or wherever with multiple launches of medium lift launch vehicles and the plan always completely breaks down because you have to launch four or six or whatever medium lift vehicles, not only successfully but on schedule, and, it, 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 and you, you get ridiculously low mission reliability figures and, and the plan becomes um, uh, unacceptable. But if we have heavy lift, we can do this. And that's what this does. This vehicle, as designed, uh, could lift 120 tons to LEO, but more importantly, using that hydrogen oxygen injection stage, it could throw 47 tons on a direct trajectory to Mars or 59 to the moon. That's how we want to do the mission. Just lift and throw and let it go. Send the payload to the planet with the upper stage of the same booster that lifts in the first place. That's how we've done every real unmanned planetary mission. That's how we did the Apollo lunar mission. If you can do the Mars mission that way, right there you've gone 90% of the way towards taking the Mars mission out of the world, the Battlestar Galactica fantasy, and putting it in our world. So what do you do? Next chart. Okay. This shows a mission sequence. In the first year of operation, you launch one of these boosters off the Cape, use that upper stage to throw a 40-ton payload on a minimum energy trajectory to Mars. What is that payload? Next chart. Consists of a number of things. The primary object is the Earth return vehicle. ERV. It is a little rocket ship for coming back from Mars. It's got a small cabin that can house four astronauts on a six-month transit from Mars to Earth. No one's in it now. Then below that are two methane oxygen uh, uh, chemical propulsion stages, which, however, are unfueled. And then slung below the vehicle, not shown in this 